Hello, all of you. I'm Dr. Kavita Parniyappan, and I work as academic director at UON Singapore, which is a wholly owned entity of the University of Newcastle, Australia. At the outset, I would like to thank the organizers of the International Conference on Environmental Science and Applications 2020 for inviting me to be a keynote speaker today. In the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to share my research on release of nanoparticles during construction activities that could potentially pollute the surrounding air and in turn affect human life. So what are nanomaterials? Nanomaterials are basically substances that have at least one dimension in 100 nanometers or less than that. A substance can be nanoscale in just one dimension or in two dimensions, or in all three dimensions. Surface films or coatings onto surfaces like the scratch resistant coating that you have on your smartphones are a good example for nanomaterials that are nanoscale in one dimension. Strands or fibers of nanomaterials are the ones that are nanoscale in two dimension. And the particles, that is nanoparticles, which are dispersed in air are usually nanoscale in all three dimensions. Nanoparticles can exist by themselves as singles, or they can be fused with other substances. They may also group together to form aggregates or agglomerates. Nanoparticles exist in quite a variety of shapes ranging from spherical, tubular, or irregular. Moving on to the classification of nanomaterials, as we saw in the earlier slide, nanomaterials can be classified based on their dimensionality, that is whether they are nanoscale in one dimension, two dimensions, or three dimensions. Generally speaking, the nanomaterials that are nanoscale in one dimension don't pose that much of a health risk compared to the two-dimensional and three-dimensional ones. Nanomaterials can also be classified based on their structure, that is morphology, as spherical, wires, helices, zigzags, pillars, tubes, nanobells or pyramids, nanocubes, etc. Then, depending on the composition of the nanomaterials, they can be classified as single, which can be compact or hollow, or composites, that is, they can be coated with other kinds of substances, or they can be encapsulated by other substances, or a combination. Based on their uniformity and agglomeration state, the isometric and inhomogeneous forms of nanomaterials can be classified as dispersed and agglomerates based on how they are dispersed in the environment. So why are nanomaterials important? Why do we keep talking about these nanomaterials now more often? Due to their extremely small size, nanomaterials are said to possess a much greater surface area is to volume ratio compared to their bigger counterparts. And this provides them with much greater chemical reactivity and strength. They also possess unique physical and mechanical properties new quantum effects in terms of optical, electronic, photonic, electrical, and magnetic behaviors have also been noted with nanomaterials. So where do these nanomaterials occur? Where are they found? Are they found naturally or are they made by men? Well, nanoparticles do occur naturally on the earth, and one can find them in forest fires, volcanic ash, ocean spray, fine sand and dust, and sometimes even in biological matter like viruses. On the other hand, synthetic nanomaterials are made during the various activities that mankind is involved in. These can either be accidentally formed as byproducts during the various human activities, or they can be specifically engineered in a laboratory for a particular purpose. The latter that are engineered in the laboratory are called ENMs or engineered nanoparticles or engineered nanomaterials. The nanomaterials can also be carbon-faced. The most common example is a carbon nanotube. 
or they can be metal based like titanium dioxide or dendrimers that is star shaped highly branched molecules or composites where they are combined with other polymers. So these are some of the types of nanomaterials. So how are these nanomaterials produced? Remember I told you earlier that they can be man-made synthetic nanomaterials. So how are they produced? To simplify the production process of nanomaterials, we can actually tell that they can be either produced by the top-down approach or the bottom-up approach. In the top-down approach, the bulk materials are broken down physically or chemically to yield smaller fragments and then nanoscale substances. Whereas in the bottom-up approach, it is built atom by atom, joining them little by little to form clusters. And then the clusters are joined to form nanoscale structures. So this is how nanomaterials are generally produced. So once they are produced and released into the environment, how can these nanomaterials gain entry into the human body? The nanoparticles mainly enter through the lungs and due to their extremely small size, they can reach the alveolar region quite easily and can also enter the bloodstream from there because remember, they have a very large surface area. So it's very easy for them to enter the bloodstream. The second most common route of entry is through the skin. Most of the time, nanomaterials accumulate around the hair follicles and wait for injuries or skin abrasions to happen so that they can gain entry into the body. Ingestion route cannot be totally ignored as accidental ingestion through contaminated hands can happen or nowadays even medicines are made using nanomaterials and obviously when you consume them, that is a mode of entry for nanomaterials to enter into the body. So once they gain entry into the body, obviously they cause a range of health effects in your body. But before we can go and study the health effects, I would like to highlight that our body is also capable of eliminating them effectively. Nanoparticles that are less than five nanometers are actively eliminated through the kidneys in the form of urine. Particles that are less than 100 nanometers, usually bigger than 20 nanometers and less than 100 nanometers, are eliminated by the liver. And lungs also can breathe out the particles which are bigger than 100 nanometers in size. Much, much larger particles, that is particles that are more than 200 nanometers, are usually processed by the spleen. So these are the modes by which nanoparticles can be eliminated from the human body. So now let, let us look at the health effects. Health effects of nanoparticles is a huge area now. And lots of research is focused around this area. The effects of nanoparticles are mainly studied on lungs, the genetic makeup, that is the genes, the nervous system, that is the nerves, brain, spinal cord, etc., the cardiovascular system, which includes the heart, blood vessels, and blood, the kidneys, skin, reproductive system, specifically the male reproductive system, that is nanomaterials are found to be highly toxic to the sperms, morphology of the sperms can be affected and of course the gastrointestinal tract as well. But as our today's topic is focused on nanomaterials released from construction activities, I'm going to restrict myself to the three main nanomaterials that are found to be released during such activities. That is nanosilica, nanosilver, and nanotitanium dioxide. The toxicity of these nanomaterials to the human system is slowly being established little by little by various researchers worldwide and whatever we have now in terms of their toxicity are merely proposals for their mechanisms of action. So there is yet lots of research that needs to confirm, that needs to be done to confirm whether these proposals are right or whether these proposals can be taken further up. So let us see now one by one. First is nanosilica. 
So nanosilica mainly attacks the immune cells and causes impairment of the immune system. So nanosilica particles cause cell death, very simple, cell death. But how they cause that cell death? They basically follow several pathways to cause that cell death. Number one, primarily, they induce the release of cytokines, which cause inflammation and the cells get injured and die as a result. And this is referred to as necrotic cell death. That is when the cell gets injured and dies, it is called necrosis, necrotic cell death. Number two is when they are low in concentration. That is when they are present at subtoxic levels. I'm talking about nanosilica. When they are present at subtoxic levels, they trigger autophagy. So what is this autophagy? It is the process of cleaning out damaged cells. Literally speaking, auto means self and phagy means eat. That is, the cells destroy themselves or self-eat. Number three, when they are in very high concentration or during long exposure periods, they do exactly the opposite. That is, they inhibit autophagy. And this results in apoptosis. So what is apoptosis? It is a form of programmed cell death or in simple terms, cellular suicide. Through this process, the cells or the cell contents are packed into small membrane packets for garbage collection by immune cells that come along their way later. Thus, whatever pathway it takes, nanosilica ultimately kills the cell. It's as simple as that. So nanosilver, that's the next in line that we have for today. Nanosilver can also penetrate the cells and it can cause numerous effects depending on the cell or the type of cell that it basically invades. It can disrupt the mitochondria, causing it to dysfunction. It can induce the formation of ROS, which is reactive oxygen species, and that leads to oxidative stress and inflammation. It can even affect the DNA by causing chromosomal aberrations and thereby it can inhibit the growth of the cells. So that is what nanosilver is capable of doing. Next is nanotitanium dioxide. Nanotitanium dioxide on entering the cell can affect the lysosomes and mitochondria. When lysosomes are affected, it can lead to autophagy. Remember, we saw this autophagy earlier when we spoke about nanosilica. Exactly the same process. It can cause autophagy where the cell eats itself. And when mitochondria is affected, ROS, again, the same thing, reactive oxygen species can be formed, which can lead to inflammation. Nanotitanium dioxide also leads to an excessive release of glutamate into the extracellular region, that means outside of the cell. And this can lead to neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, etc. Nanotitanium dioxide is also known to cause imbalances in intracellular sodium ions and extracellular potassium ions, where in the hippocampal neurons. And this can affect the survival, growth, and physiology of the vertebrates. Now that we have seen what are nanoparticles, how they are classified, why they have gained so much of importance in the past few decades, what are the different types of nanomaterials, how are they produced, how they can enter and leave a human body, and of course, what kinds of health effects they can potentially cause. It is time for us now to look at the construction sector specifically, which is capable of producing the three nanomaterials that we have seen. That is nanosilica, nanosilver, and nanotitanium dioxide. 
So let's now enter the construction industry. <clears throat> With the increasing population boom, the need for new living and business spaces becomes a requisite all throughout. And as the technological developments are increasing at an exponential rate, the need for modernizing the existing structures and coming up with new infrastructure also becomes essential. Even if not new buildings, existing buildings are also constantly modified to either expand the living space or enhance the living standard or repair structural and architectural defects within the building. Renovating the buildings are also done to prolong the age of the building, especially schools, hospitals, and public buildings that are necessary for the long-term usage. Studies have estimated that almost 60% of the world's population would be living in the urban area in near future. And for this to happen, the rate of construction would further have to increase. In recent years, the unique properties of nanomaterials have rendered them to be used extensively in the construction industry. Concrete is one of the main elements used in construction works and is formed by mixing coarse and fine aggregates, sand, Portland cement, and water. The mixture is then put into the rotating drum to form cement paste. Studies have found that addition of nanotubes and nanosilica to concrete enhances the concrete's flexibility, durability, and viscosity. A little bit further, researchers have also identified that when concrete is coated with nanotitanium dioxide, it induces self-cleaning properties to the concrete. So what do I mean by self-cleaning property? Well, when sunlight strikes on the concrete, the nanotitanium dioxide reacts with the light and contributes to the decomposition of volatile organic compounds, commonly called as VOCs. In simple terms, nanotitanium dioxide basically shatters the dirt into basic forms such as oxygen, water, carbon dioxide, and nitrate or sulfate molecules. Thus, in the presence of UV light, photocatalysts like nanotitanium dioxide helps to convert air pollutants from toxic to lesser toxic forms. Next in line comes paint. In the construction industry, paint is widely used for aesthetic purposes of protection against adverse weather or environmental conditions. There are many different kinds of paints, such as water-based paint, oil-based paint, emulsion paint, enamel paint, epoxy paint, anti-condensation paint, silicone paint, anti-corrosive paint, fungicidal paint, anti-dust paint, etc., etc. Each type of paint is used for a specific purpose. For example, anti-corrosive paints are mainly applied to steel for corrosion protection. Fungicidal paints are applied to exterior facade, such as wall fences to protect fungal growth. However, exterior wall paints can be easily deteriorated by adverse weather conditions, such as rainwater, heat, and moisture. This forced researchers to study the effectiveness of nanomaterials in paint formulation, and indeed, they were successful. Nanosilver, which has antibacterial and antifungal properties, have found it to give biocidal effects when used in wall paint or when given as a coating to the walls. Similar to nanosilver, nanotitanium dioxide has also been found to react with UV from sunlight to serve as an anti-fouling agent. Further to that, nanotitanium dioxide is also being used as coating for window glass, walls, and roof to expel dirt and bacterial growth. Additionally, nanotitanium dioxide coated glass also prevents 
fogging by decreasing the contact between water droplets and glass surface. Nanosilica dioxide, when mixed with paints, makes them look glossy. That is, it gives a very glossy appearance and also gives them the properties such as scratch resistance and protection against corrosion. So these are the major nanomaterials that are used in the construction industry, in concrete, for self-cleaning, and in paints. Now, construction of a building includes various processes. Apart from the pre-construction stage, which includes the office works, the construction work usually starts with site clearing. Demolishing before that, if the site clearing or if the site has an existing building. Excavation, recycling of construction debris. Assembling or removal of form works, concreting, and architectural works such as painting, partition, and tiling works. If it is not a new building and is mostly renovating an existing building, then the majority of the tasks are refurbishment works, which could include changing of room layout, changing of wall paint, electrical upgrading such as lighting, heating, air conditioning system, etc. Almost all refurbishment works require drilling, hacking, and cutting of concrete. And these can be done by high-end machinery, if the building is a big one or a project a big scale, or if it is a small minor project, hand tools can also be used. So the first process that we are going to look at today is demolition. So demolition of a building generally includes demolishing concrete slab, steel beams, brick walls, concrete staircase, and architectural materials associated to the building. This is usually done by either implosion or mechanical means such as wrecking ball or excavators. Irrespective of the method used for demolition, this is a process that is known to produce significant amount of dust into the air. And this dust is also predominantly made up of nanoparticles. As the rate of demolition increases, the production of construction waste is also increasing. This leads to two major problems. Number one, lack of sufficient waste disposal area to dispose of all the generated construction waste. And number two, exhausting natural resources leading to global warming. This has forced the construction sector to recycle all the demolished debris as much as possible. It has been reported that almost 20 to 80% of demolished debris is recycled worldwide. And Singapore here deserves a special mention as almost 99% of the construction and demolition waste is recycled into wood, metal, plastic, and paper. So how is this recycle process done? The first step is large demolished debris are sorted into different types of materials. After sorting, the bulk materials are broken down either by crushing, mining, or grading into the size that is suitable to reuse in refurbishment works. During these processes, the concrete tends to produce particulate matter in various size ranges. And it has been found that 95% of these particles that are released into the environment are nanoscale. Among them, the highly reactive nanosilicates and nanoaluminosilicates have also been identified. So earlier when I spoke about concrete, I told you how concrete is made. Remember, all the components are put together in the rotating drum and they are mixed to form cement paste. Now this process is called concrete mixing and a very high amount of dust is emitted during the mixing process. That is especially when the drum is rotating. After mixing, the concrete is subjected to concrete slump test where its strength is tested. 
So this is a picture. These two pictures show you how they do the concrete slump testing. And this is a drum where it is mixed. Now the hardened concrete is then drilled and cut to convert them to the desired sizes and shapes. Studies have been done to analyze the number of nanoparticles emitted during the various concreting processes, that is during mixing, during the slump testing process, during drilling and cutting of the hardened concrete, all these activities. And it was found that maximum number of nanoparticles were released during the cutting and drilling activities in comparison with the other two, that is concrete mixing and slump testing activities. In an earlier slide, I had already explained about the various activities that could be included under refurbishment works. And as I said, most of the works include drilling, hacking and cutting of concrete. And just now in the previous slide, we saw that these are the processes that basically generate tremendous amounts of nanoparticles into the air. Studies have revealed that activities like sanding, emptying of waste materials, and punching of timber produce much smaller size nanoparticles, that is in the range of five to 30 nanometers. And bigger size nanomaterials that is in the range of 30 to 100 nanometers are generated during processes such as wall chasing, the picture is given here for you. That means making grooves in the walls. That's a process called wall chasing. And then cementing, welding and hot hair torching. You see a picture of hot hair torching here. Cutting, hammering, spraying. So this is a picture of spraying here painting, and even ground cleaning and sweeping. So all these processes are set to release substances in the range of 30 to 100 nanometers. However, in an actual construction site, not all project, projects use machines to do these refurbishment works. Hand tools are still used to do the refurbishment works if the project scale is small, or if the work area where the project needs to be done is not big enough to use the machine. However, nanoparticles were generated irrespective of whether machinery or hand tools were used for these processes. So it really doesn't matter whether people are using hand tools or whether people are using high-end machinery to generate, to do the refurbishment work, still nanoparticles are produced. Thus, we have seen from all the existing studies that among all the construction activities, drilling and cutting of concrete followed by recycling of construction materials release a large amount of nanoparticles into the environment. Further to that, runoff from the wall panes coated with nanoparticles can also release nanoparticles into the surrounding. So far, most of the research that has been done has only measured the number of nanoparticles released and other aspects such as size, shape, and types of the released nanoparticles are yet to be identified at sectoral levels. We also need to establish the abilities of these nanoparticles to remain in the environment. That is, for how, how long they can remain. Do they undergo any changes? in what forms they are more stable, etc. Finally, there is also a necessity to establish the possible potential effects to exposed individuals and to the exposed environment. There is lots of scope remaining for the future generation in terms of nanotechno nanotechnology as well as nanotoxicology research. Hoping that my today's session would kindle the interest in the field of nanotoxicology research among some of the attendees of this conference, I would now like to end my presentation here. Thank you for your time and wish you all a very good virtual conference experience. Keep safe and take care. Bye-bye.